module 4 limitations of language corpus so far we have understood the features constructions or corpus now we are talking about some of the limitations so in this module we will refer to some of the limitations of language corpus noted by generative linguists technicians interactional linguists text linguists poetic text analysts and others so we will go one by one the first thing is that what the generative linguists say corpus has been a target of general linguistics generative grammarians for years they have categorically mentioned that we are looking about the performance data through corpus but we are not interested in it we are interested into the competence of language users linguistic competence so corpus is not a valid uh, way to interpret a language Chomsky in 1968 clearly stated that any natural corpus will be skilled. Some sentence only occur because they are obvious, others because they are false, still others because they are impolite. The corpus, if natural, will be so widely skewed that the description based on it would not be more than a mere list. So, Chomsky has made a very strong criticism about corpus usage. Even in 2004, he categorically denied the value of corpus. He said, corpus linguistics does not mean anything. It is like saying, suppose a physicist decides Suppose physics and chemistry decide that instead of relying on experiments, what they are going to do is to take videotapes of things happening in the world and they will collect huge videotapes of everything that is happening and from that maybe they will come up with some or generalizations or insights. Well, you know science do not do that. So, what we find that not only Chomsky, many other people who belong to the scheme of generative linguistics are not at all interested to refer to language corpora for the research because for them corpus has no value or importance to them. The reality is something like that. Within a few decades, it has been clearly understood that corpus has tremendous functional relevance even if it is stringently strongly criticized by the generative grammarians. As you have noted that even many generative grammarians are now inclined to identify to see if their observations, their arguments, their hypothesis are at all validated or verified with the real use noted in corpus. Even Chomsky has agreed to attest the importance of corpus. In some disciplines, some sub branches of linguistics, particularly in phonetics and child language acquisition. In phonetics, you need the actual data, speech data to identify the phonemes, allophones, the distributions, pronunciations and other in properties inputted to it, intonations, tones, juncture, pause and other supersegmental properties also. So here, no intuitive data can you actually substantiate or help you much in understanding the properties of speech. In cases of language acquisitions also, you need to have the data of the language learners to understand how they actually perform, they acquire the language. Chomsky has said categorically, if you want to use hints from data that you acquire by looking at large corpuses, fine, that is useful information for you. Yes, you are observing 
the tides to understand the undercurrent behind it. So, in such many sub experimental situations also, you need to refer to the empirical data. So, all the criticisms of the generative schools hindered initial progress of corpus in the early 60s and 70s. It did not succeed to stop entirely the practice of using corpus in linguistic research and applications. We have noted that by 80s and 90s, even many generative grammarians have shifted to empirical linguistics and empirical data to validate their hypothesis and observations. By 80s, it was able to establish itself as one of the most promising fields of linguistic research and investigation in the world. So, even if native grammarians have strong criticism against corpus linguistics, corpus linguistics is flourishing and is destined to flourish more in years to come. This is one kind of criticism given by generative grammarians, but there are other, other limitations of corpus linguistics which we have not yet overcome. We will look into those aspects. First, paucity of balanced text representation. This is an important issue. Is that so for the corpora available across the world, if we take all the languages into consideration, invariably you will find out that the number of corpora generated in written texts is much more than the corpora generated in spoken texts. Why it is so? What is the problem with that? The problem is that Generation of corpus in written text is technically much simpler a process than generating speech corpus in digital form. Now, you can ask why this is so. There are obvious some technical issues involved into it. So, any person without having any knowledge about, uh, say, the technical tools normally used in speech data collection is really handicapped how to collect the speech data. But even if you do not know that much of things for collecting speech data, you can do it very easily in cases of written text. If you can type something in the digital form in your own language, you can perhaps generate its text corpus quite easily within a few days, which is perhaps not possible in cases of spoken texts. So, what I want to emphasize here is that because of some technical constraints, because of some limitations, because of some uh, hurdles in the area of speech corpus generation, we have shifted more attention towards written text corpus generation. But this is in no way related with liking or disliking of the text of one type of text to the other. We also know that uh, a spoken text, a speech corpus is much more varied, much more authentic, much more reliable in representation of a language or a variety. We have to start. At the same time, we must admit that capturing so much of varieties of speech in its most reliable manner and storing them in a digital form, processing them and retrieving necessary information and data from those texts is really a tough task, highly complicated task. If this is so, then it is not easy for anybody until and unless you are well trained to generate a speech corpus. So, there is a technical issues in involved into it. So, technical issues are important in generation of text corpus. Collection of data from speech text and collection of data from written text are two different tasks. 
while we are trying to collect speech data, we have to take into to many things into consideration. We have to identify people when they are interacting, when they are in spontaneous verbal interactions. We have to use certain devices and tools to record their data. That is one part. Then we have to find out whether this data is properly recorded. There are a lot of news may come into the picture while we are collecting data from speech text, spoken interactions when people are in, involved into it. So this collection part involves various subtle, subtle and uh, refined technical issues that has to be adequately addressed before we are able to capture data. After that, we need to convert the spoken text which has been captured and digitized into written form. That is further more complicated task. While you are transcribing texts, there are certain, obviously certain, now presently available certain tools by which we can convert those texts into written form. But in reality, there are many technicalities involved in it. First thing that, whether the audio text is properly transcripted into written form, that is a vital issue. And as you know that in a written sp spoken text, there are, there are various issues of normal speech. Those things may come into the picture at the time of transcription. So transcription is another complicated area developing a stretch purpose. Third part is processing. Processing of spoken text is more, more, a more a real complex task. It is can be done only by certain experts, not by a layman. So, now obviously, until and unless you have a large human resources was properly trained, adequately trained, and about the processes of speech corpus generation, transcription, processing extraction information and analysis it is very difficult to develop a speech corpus. So because of some technical reasons we did not get much data in cases of speech corpus. On the other hand this is very much possible in cases of written text corpus which is comparatively easier to compile as well as analyze. The next point which you would like to emphasize is the scarcity of dialogic texts. This is really an unimpressive, one of the major limitations. Recently, some scholars have raised a voice against corpus linguistics with the argument that the present day corpora failed to represent the impromptu and unprepared texts, dialogic texts which usually take place spontaneously in our regular linguistic activities of the people. That is true, that lot of data are being produced regularly in different types of linguistic interactions. But a very least amount of these texts are actually being represented in the form of corpus. They also argue that the absence of texts from dialectic interactions can make a corpus skilled and crippled because these corpus lack in the aspects of spontaneity of speech, which is one of the most valuable features of properties of a natural language. It's true. Due to the lack of property, a corpus fails to represent the real picture of language usage found in normal, regular life, even if we agree the fact that the data is a natural one, spontaneous one, an impromptu one, with samples of dialogues, dialogic interactions. So what they argue is that until and unless we have that real dialogic texts, which is so spontaneous, so impromptu, the language is not adequately represented. The basic texture of a natural language is actually damaged without those representations and present day corpus is not actually focusing on it. So we must admit that 
there are definitely some grains of truth in this criticism. It is true that Carnes, either in spoken or written form, is actually a database of a removed from its actual context of occurrence. In fact, the detachment of from the text makes a corpus a lifeless thing. A lifeless language database which is devoid of many properties of living dialogic interactions as well as of information related to discourse and pragmatics. As a result of this, a corpus may fail to ventilate into the uh, uh, into the actual real purpose which is carefully concealed within a complex linguistic action we call negotiation. Moreover, it fails to identify the situations of language in use as well as fails to determine the interactive action games involved within the dialogic interactions. Describe properly the cognitive perceptual background from which the interlocutors derive their cognitive and perceptual means of communication. So, we must agree that when a speech corpus isolated from the context of its actual occurrence may lose much valuable information embedded into it in the situations in the discourse. So, Analysis of speech corpus available so far cannot provide those information which are missing there. So what happens that we don't, we are not able now to analyze the speech corpus and identify what are the motives of the interactants are actually hidden in their verbal interactions, how speakers cause the mental conditions of the intention of the listeners while they are addressing and how. The speech is being used as a tool to continue and terminate an ongoing spoken interaction. So, as you know, in a dialogic interaction, many things are involved into it. So, the context where it is occurring, the people who are participating in the interactions, the situations that motivated that interactions, the motive goal that involved those people in interactions. So, these are not available directly from the text itself. It is available from the background, from the situation, from the context where the dialogic interaction is actually taking place. But we do not have no scale or this mechanism or technology by which we could capture those properties. So, definitely, speech uh, corpus, even if it is a very multi dimensional, it fails to capture the dialogic interactions and the speeches are uh, involved into it. The other major limitation of a corpus is that we know very well, very clearly that if you refer to any, any written text, you can find out that it involves or it includes not only text, also many other properties are there which we call extra textual elements. Say, if you refer to a school textbook, you can find out that there are some texts, but along with that text, we can find out some pictures, tables, sketches, diagrams, figures, images, formula and other visual elements. So, those visual elements or non-textual elements are vital in the text just because they carry huge amount of information which are necessary for understanding the issue, the content, the concept being explained in the book. So, this gives additional advantages to the learners to understand how a particular concept is explained, elaborated with examples, with visuals, with tables, with diagrams and pictures and other things. What I argue here is that any text material which is produced also supported by several non-textual elements. Think just imagine of a newspaper even published today without any pictures or images. 
Do you think you would be more interested to understand or to read those papers? First thing. Second thing, do you think that without those images and pictures and tables and all those things, the texts should be equally intelligible or you can understand the whole thing equally clear, clearly without the images? If not so, then it is very clear to us that non-textual elements or pictorial elements or visual elements carry tremendous load of information in a text. Now, while we are trying to develop a corpus, say written text corpus, we usually ignore those pictorial elements. That means, a major load of information is actually lost in the corpus. A text alongside a picture should have been much more intelligible, much more explicit in information than the text itself. So, what I want to hammer here is that present day practice of corpus utilization is actually a crippled practice because the non-textual elements, visual elements, pictorial elements are actually lost, not taken into consideration while compiling a corpus. This is a real drawback of a corpus. We need to devise, we need to think seriously how those non-textual elements can also be embedded, can also be taken into consideration while analyzing a corpus or developing a corpus. This is a real challenge for the new generations of experts who are working on corpus generation purpose. So, what we find here is that those pictorial elements, those pictures are important in corpus building. So, in electronic person, when we are developing corpora, we need to have some devices, some systems, some methods, so that those elements are included. So, present day corpus without those pictorial elements is actually providing half load of the information available in the text. So, we need to think seriously how to overcome this problem. The other form. The other limitations, which is also a very important limitation to us, is lack of poetic texts. The recent trend in these days is that whenever we are trying to develop corpora, it is basically text corpora, we always emphasize on prose texts and rarely we develop corpus on poetic texts, texts in poetry form. Why it is so? First thing is that we always believe that a prose text is a far better representation of a language than a poetic text. So, perhaps a corpus of prose texts can have a better understanding of a language than the corpus of poetic text. Second important thing is that it is noted that expectation of readers from a prose text is different from that prose text. What we expect from a poetic composition differs from that of a prose composition very clearly. In the, in, the, in the world of information and knowledge, we need clear and cohesive language full of clarity and transparency, so that the knowledge and information feel into the texture of language without any hitch. But in case of language of the poetry, we are not about interested into the content, but about the emotion, the expression that are very important to us. So, 
we are having two different expectations from a prose text and a poetic text. While in cases of prose text, we are more interested in the clarity of information, precise information to the point of information. In case of poetic text, our expectation is something different. We are more interested to explore about the emotion, about the impression and the poetic fervor embedded into the text. So, since in our practical world, prosaic texts, prosaic prose texts give us a better understanding of information, of language, we generally give importance on prose text. Language normally used in poetry, songs and rhymes is not similar to the language used in texts, used in literature, essays, science, technology, and commerce, and newspapers, etc. And this is quite clear, you know that the way we use language in poetry and the way we use language in prose texts of different times is actually very different. Use of words, multi-word units, sentence structures, idiomatic expressions, etc. are different in poetry. Word order is different. Sometimes we change the structure of word to fit into the frame of rhyme, to maintain the rhythm and other things. So it may happen that in sentence, in a poetry, you can find out the verb is occurring at the initial position of a sentence rather than the terminal position, while in a prose text, normally we find is that verb comes at the terminal position. So this kind of linguistic liberty are actually taken in a poetic text, which are normally not allowed in prose text. To match a couplet, maybe the structure of a word may be defined, changed by, by a poet. But we hardly come across a prose text where the structure of a word is modified by a prose writer just because he wants it. So, poetic has a specific, poetic text has a specific kind of usage of words, terms, even sentence structures which are different from the prose text. In sum, language of prose is almost concrete, realistic, pragmatic and documentative, while the language of poetry is mostly abstract, imaginative and surrealistic. And because of these two characteristic differences between a prose text and poetic texts, at present moment we are not interested to combine both the texts together in a corpus. Rather, we are interested to keep, keep those two types of text corpus as separate genre. So, on one side there is prose text and another side is poetic text. And if possible, we can make a comparative studies between the two to find out how they differ in form, in content, in texture, in structure, in composition and treatment, as well as in goal. So, uh, when people complain that uh, poetic texts are not included into prose text corpus, uh, we generally do not support them. We believe that poetic text has the potential to be treated as a separate corpus of its own in the merits of its qualifications, features and let it be separate one, so that it does not mix up with the prose text and makes the whole process of language analysis and study complicated one. Let the two types of corpus be there side by side, cross genre analysis is possible to identify how poetic texts are different from prose texts. As now we can do the research or analysis how spoken texts are different from the written text based on the data and corpus available in speech form 
as well as the retinal part. So these are the major limitations of corpus. Besides that, there are some other limitations also. I need to like highlight. There are some other limitations of corpus. Some of which are, are hinted by uh, many scholars across the years. There are some of this. A corpus often fail to highlight the social, evocative, and historical aspects of relating to a language. As you will clearly know, that language is also triggered various social factors evocative factors, historical aspects involved into it. So while analyzing a corpus, it becomes difficult for us to identify how those elements have been quite useful, practical or uh, instrumental in shaping of the language. From a corpus, uh, from a corpus it is not easy, easy to define why a particular type of language is used as a standard one and while others are regionally considered as digital. This is an important question. So if we analyze the corpus data, we cannot clearly show why a particular variety is treated as the standard one, while the other varieties are considered as dialects or uh, regional varieties of the sub standard variety. So there are some other non-linguistic factors which are involved into it. So analysis of corpus hardly fails to show why this is happening. Corpus also fails to show how linguistic differences can play decisive roles to establish and maintain group identity of speakers. There are various social groups, social network groups, we know that. So corpus analysis cannot show how a particular uh, social network groups are using a different kinds of language. How intellect determines one's power, position, and economic status in society. And it also fails to show how language differs depending on the domains of usage in various fields of human knowledge. Corpus fails to show how a narration of a story or a novel or an essay disturbs some readers with evocation of emotion, while others readers remain undisturbed. It's a real crucial question. We don't get any particular information from analysis corpus why the same text creates one reaction on the mind of our uh, readers, while the same cassette text fails to evoke any reactions on the other group of readers. The corpus analysis does not help us to understand why the same text is so much uh, having emotional load on a particular uh, reader and that does not happen for others. Also, <coughs> it fails to show how knowledge of the world and context play crucial roles in determining the actual meaning of an utterance. Also, corpus cannot show how the uh, real world knowledge are actually helping the people to understand the meaning of the words. How a living language is forced to evolve with change of time and society. How language, why language change with time, with society. That answer is never retrieved from an analysis corpus. And it is also not possible for us to identify how a language is divided into many types due to various non-linguistic factors. And how two different languages combine together to give birth a new language in the course of time. That is a unique question or a still unexplored question how two languages are coming close to each other and that gives birth to a new language. So, so far the language analysis of corpus have not been successful one to, uh, to address some of the questions raised here. So, from this module to sum up what we find is that Corpus is tremendously useful in various domains of linguistics, but at the same time, it has some limitations which are yet to overcome. So, uh, this is now time for us to seriously think how we can overcome those limitations. And if we can do that, perhaps corpus can be the most reliable resource for human understanding human language and cognition relating to language. Thank you.